Thanks, Steph. So, good morning. Um, good to be, good to be with you this morning. Um, so, you will have your Bibles open at John 13. Hopefully, just keep them open at that. Uh, please, we're going to be continuing on in our series in John. Um, Today is going to mark a bit of a change, a bit of a shift in John. Uh, John, you can kind of divide John up into two sections, really. The first sort of 12 chapters are sort of where Jesus is, um, I guess, he's been sort of proven who he was through his miracles and through his teaching to the crowds. But um, things change in John chapter 13 onwards. Um, and in order to help us understand the change, um, I don't know about you, if you if you've parent, if you are a parent and you've got kids, we're at a stage in our life where um, our eldest, Jude, is, um, he's moving into big school now, so he's a big lad now, and uh, we're at that point where parents, you're trying to decide, do you believe him in his home in the house? Are we at that point now? When, when is the point when you're able to leave them on, on their own in the house or and you're kind of half freaking out as a parent, like never done this before, but do we need to do this? There's going to be a, there's some point you're going to have to do it. Is it now? Is it not? And so we've done this um, for a few short times with Jude and um, he's done very well so far and the house is standing, not burnt down, nothing major as catastrophe has happened. Um, apart from the other day, I get locked in the house, I think. I've actually locked him in accidentally. Um, but apart from that, um, it's been fine. But if you're a parent and you've been in that position, put yourself in the, the last few, like the last minute or two or seconds, maybe even before you leave the house. Right? So as you're leaving the house, you want to try and just, you're kind of shouting out the really important last minute things. Right? So when we're leaving the house, we're probably not going to say to Jude, um, now Jude, don't forget, make your bed. Right? We're racing out there, don't forget, make your bed. Now, as important as that is, as much as we want him to make his bed, it's probably not going to be a thing we're going to be shouting as we go out the door. Um, or we're not going to say, don't forget, put the hands in, or let the hands out. Um, as important as it is to let our wee hands out, it's not probably top up there on the priority list when we're racing out the door. Right? Or we're not going to say things like, um, now, now, you don't, don't, remember to take a wee break from your homework. Take a break, go and play FIFA. Get yourself a few wee games of FIFA. Don't, don't you be working too hard. Probably not going to say things like that either. Probably not a major threat, that one. We're going to be shouting probably things that are really important. Like these are the last minute things before we rush out the door. It's going to be things like, Jude, you know, um, don't lock the door and we go out. Make sure and keep the door locked. Or don't open the door to someone you don't know. Right? Or things like, I don't know, maybe um, don't, don't, be, uh, don't touch the matches. Right? Don't be touching matches or flames or fires or anything hot. Or if you're boiling the kettle, don't pour it over yourself. Things that are kind of really vital for his own safety. Uh, my, my mum and dad, my mum and dad didn't leave me in my own house ever. Um, and there's, there's, now, there's m multiple reasons why. Maybe just because they were never away, I don't know. But um, there's also probably reasons that they haven't revealed to me for that as well. Um, but uh, I remember they did, they did leave me unsupervised in the garage one time with a, a can of thinners and matches. That didn't work well. So I would say that might have fed into the narrative of why they didn't leave me on their own. Um, but it um, took a wee while for that hand to recover after that. But you, you get the idea, when you're rushing out as a parent, the thing you shout, the last minute instructions you shout to your kids are the important ones, the vital ones, the ones that they need to remember. And so Jesus has got to a point here now, right? He's reached the milestone. He's got to a point where he knows he's going to soon be leaving his disciples. So look at verse 1 in chapter 13. It says, Now before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father. So up until this point, it has kind of spanned his the, the, the years of his ministry. He's been doing loads of miracles, proving to prove who he was, that he's the Messiah, the Son of God. But now, from chapter 13 on, it's going to really sort of zoom in on those last few days and hours of his life here. And as that does that, he knows that his hour is coming. He knows that it's going to be very close to the, that time when he's going to be crucified. And so he knows it's drawn very close to the time when he's going to leave his disciples. He's not going to be with them anymore. And so what he wants to do is really emphasize some of the key things that he needs them to remember as he is going to be leaving them very soon. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at this. We're going to look in chapter 13 because it, it gives us one of those final instructions. And we're going to look at that, those final, uh, that final instruction that chapter 13 deals with. And so we're going to divide up into, very simply, 
It's going to be uh, the what, the why, and the how. So what is the instruction that he gives them? Why did he see this as being an important one to give them at this point? And also then, how? So how did he want them to live out this instruction? So let's look at the what, first of all. So the what, so open, uh, just follow along. Go to verse 34 of chapter 13, which has already been read. And it says this. It says, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another just as I have loved you you also are to love one another. So here's Jesus' almost last-minute instruction, important, vital instruction that he gives before he leaves. He says, I want you to remember to love one another. Now, I don't know about you. um, Maybe it's it's where I was brought up. So I was brought up in Tyrone. See, down in Tyrone, you didn't talk about love that much. Right? You didn't talk about love. That wasn't a, that was a, that was a bit of a soft thing to be talking about. Right? Let's be honest. Right? You talk about love, and that's, you, that's maybe even, that's just, that's, leave that for the girls. They can talk about that. And even the girls didn't really talk about an awful lot either. Right? We weren't overly in touch with our emotions and throne or anything like that. So we didn't talk about those things. And then you brought it into the church setting, into this thing, this, into sort of this context of God. And again, if you started kind of talking a lot about God's love, well, so you're, you're that type of Christian, <laughs> kind of the watery type, you know, kind of like, oh, right, God's love and all, right? Uh, you're always talking about God's love. What about God as a judge? Now we're talking. Now we're talking. That's the real stuff. None of those other watery, kind of airy, fairy, God's love, God's love. In John chapter 13, Jesus completely blows that thinking out of the water, right? Because Jesus sees this topic of love as being one of the most important things to leave with his disciples before he leaves. And so all of that other sort of thoughts on love, is it blows that out of the water, and Jesus really zooms in on this. And you notice he gives it in a form of a command. So it's a new command he gives them. Now, this isn't, Jesus isn't here given some kind of, it's not advice he's given. Um, he's not sort of given a bit of a last minute kind of, you know, pick me up pep talk. He's not thinking, oh, well, no, I'm going to be leaving these disciples very soon here, and I'm not going to be with them. And so, right, we need to give them a bit of a pick me up because, you know, it's going to be hard for them. And so, right, let's gather around and we'll give you a bit of a pep talk. Here's what I'm thinking you should do. Listen, try your best, you know, to love each other. That's probably going to be helpful. No, it's much, much stronger than that because it's actually a command he gives them. He commands them to love each other. Now, we don't, we don't, like, we don't like commands, right? Naturally, we don't like commands. We don't like people telling us what to do. But in any context, we don't like that. And I think for me, even growing up, I, di- I didn't like sort of commands in Scripture. And mostly I think that was because I didn't fully understand them. But when God gives commands in Scripture, they're always for His glory and our good. So think of even any of the, the even the, we zoom in on the Ten Commandments, think of any of those. When God says, don't be stealing, don't steal, um, well, he's, he's saying that for his glory, but also for our good, because it's not good for us, because we get into trouble if we're stealing, and also it's not good for the person we're stealing from. Or he says, don't covet. Well, that's, that's good. That's a good thing. That's glorifying to God. But if, if we covet, he also knows that's detrimental to us, because it leaves us with a chip on our shoulder. It leaves us discontent, unsatisfied. So he says, don't covet. It's good for you, and it's glorifying to me, and you can do it for all the commands. And so this one is no different. When he gives us a command to love, it's glorifying to him, but he knows it's also good for us. It's the best for us. Now, when he says it's a new commandment, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily new teaching, because we know he gave this teaching. We can even see this teaching back in Leviticus when he says to love your neighbor as yourself through Moses. Um, So we can see that teaching then. So this isn't this isn't, Jesus hasn't suddenly turned on sort of this love switch, and he's saying, right, okay, here's a whole new concept here. You need to love each other. It's not new teaching, but Jesus is here trying to, I think he's here, he's trying to re-emphasize or redefine what actually love actually is. And it'll be so different from what he is seeing in the culture and the context around him that it'll be like a new commandment. And so it's not new teaching, 
but it's a new commandment here he's given, and he wants to re-emphasize um, and sort of deepen the disciples' understanding of what it actually means here to love each other. So, that's very simple. The what is to love each other. Love each other as he has loved them. And notice he's not… Th- this teaching isn't… Um, this, is, this isn't for specifically for their love for non-Christians. Now, he'll teach on that in other times, obviously, and we know that's important to love everyone and love those who aren't Christians as well. And um, in Matthew, he'll teach on that, how it's important to to love those who hate you and pray for those who persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely. He'll teach on that, absolutely, and that's vitally important. But here, he's he's zooming in on something different. He's speaking in the context of believers because he's speaking here to the 12 disciples. He's gathered them around, and he's saying, you guys, this is for you, right? I command you that you should love each other as in your fellow believers. And so this is really, really, um, this is really important for us, right? This is really important for us here. As we're gathered in this room, this teaching is for us here. Yes, we need to love those that are outside of the body of Christ, but the, this teaching this morning is for us it's for us as believers. So that's the what. What about the why? Then why, why did Jesus, why did he sort of hone in, in this, on this one command? Why did he, why was this command to love so, so important? Why is it so important? Well, look at verse 35, because he tells us, verse 35, why it is. He says, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. There's so much weight in that verse, isn't there? Jesus is saying here, this is going to be the thing, the thing that defines you as a believer, defines you as being a follower of Christ to the world. This is going to be it. And you're kind of like, Really? Really, this? Surely not. Surely it's going to be. Um, surely it's going to be, sort of how how well you know, how how well they attend the temple, or for us to attend church, or or surely it's what what church we go to, what church someone goes to. Surely that'll tell you what you know. Are they Christian? Are they Christian? What type of Christian? Surely it's surely it's the number of times that they've given their testimony around different churches. Surely that's what it, the amount of times they've shared their testimony in different places. Surely that's it, right? That's going to be a, that's going to tell you whether they're a believer or not. Surely it's how knowledgeable they are of Scripture. Like, like, come on, that's got to be up there, right? How well they know Scripture. Surely that's going to tell them if the world around them if they're a believer or not. Surely it's maybe how generous they are. How generous they are to the poor and the needy. Like, that's got to be it, right? Surely you can't tell me that it's this love thing. Well, you, you and I know, you probably know as well, I certainly know that there are people that um, are so faithful in church attendance, they'll come to church at everything, everything that's on, uh, and yet those people are nowhere with Jesus. I know people who have toured the country giving their testimony, and they are nowhere with Jesus. I know people who could quote off Scripture verses, maybe you as well, quote off verse after verse just like that, and you're kind of weaving in awe of them. They can just do that, and they are nowhere with Jesus. I know people who are the most generous people you will ever meet. I mean, they will literally give you the bit out of their mouth and yet they're nowhere with Jesus. And so none of those things are really solid markers. Jesus says here, this is how the world will know that you're my disciples, if you love one another. That's why he gives this command. Now, him giving this command here, him highlighting this command, is not him sort of um, saying that the other commands aren't important then. This isn't him sort of trying to sort of undermine the other commandments, but rather this command will underpin all the other commandments. Look, look over in, in uh, Matthew 26. You should turn back to Matthew 26, because here he, he speaks about this and teaches this. 
In Matthew 26, you've got the Pharisees here who again, as usual, are trying to question Jesus. And in Matthew 26, or 22, verse 36, Matthew 22, sorry, Matthew 22, verse 36. Here's what it says. They say to him, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it, is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. And so Jesus is saying here that, no, it's not that the other commandments aren't important, but he's saying they all hang on these. Right? So this is sort of the underlying. This, this one, this command cuts right to the heart, right? It cuts to the motive, doesn't it? It gets right to the, it answers that why question. I like to ask the why question because the why question is so, so important. You can have people doing a lot of things, but why they are doing them is so, so key. And so what Jesus is trying to say here, listen, true True love for our brothers and sisters in Christ, um, well, that will guide and guard what you say to them, and it will guide and guard how you say it to them. True love will compel us to forgive over and over again, 70 times seven, rather than seeking vengeance. Love, it will move us to long-suffering and to patience. Right? But it's love that's going to be the underlying thing there. It's going to be the bedrock in which everything else sits. So that's why Jesus is going deep here. That's why this one's so important, because this is like the wellspring that everything else will flow out of. So the what is love each other, brothers and sisters in Christ. The why, why is it so important? Well, it's, it's the very thing that's going to define us as being believers to those around but then the question is, well, what does this love actually look like then? What does it mean to love each other? How can we love each other the way Jesus is teaching here? Well, as I said, this love, teaching on love is not, a, is not new teaching, right? So it's not as if Jesus has started now teaching on love. Jesus has been showcasing what it means to love each other right throughout his earthly ministry. But here, like in this chapter, there, he's given such a, a poignant and powerful illustration of what this love looks like. I mean, this is a powerful, powerful illustration of what it looks like. We, we, knock, like we knock this word about love, right? We knock it about all the time. Um, in, in flippant ways, in, car- like in careless ways, you can say, I do that all the time, right? So I'll say things like, I love coffee. Now, there was a wee bit of debate in my head, and perhaps I was thinking, is that flippant? It is flippant, right? It is flippant. When you con- contrast it to this, when you compare it to this, right? I like coffee, but we'll see how ridiculous it is for me to say I love coffee as we look into this. You know, when people like, yeah, hear people saying, oh, I love greys. I love greys. A wee bit of greys anatomy. That's when we need a wee bit of therapy at the weekend. Oh, yes, I love greys. Or I love my phone. Or I actually was thinking... Um, I probably should go into the other room and say this one. And they'll go, ah, oh, yeah, but you guys probably won't. But I love booba. That's what, that's what you're all thinking too, aren't you? All right? Booba, like, I know Jude will know booba, because, not because necessarily, well, he don't, maybe he does watch some of his, but, you know. Um, by the way, if you don't know booba, parents, you need to get on it. Shortage of toys this Christmas, and, uh, but booba is up there in the top ten. Boom. Just a wee tip for you to go home with. Booba, don't be Googling it now. You can Google it when you go home. Right? But it, it's, it's these things, right? You can put whatever you want in there, right? I love whatever, right? But Jesus here in chapter 13, like, completely blows all of those silly misuses, misinterpretations of what love is, blows them clean out of the water here. Let's read it together. Look at verse 4. So Jesus then rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Now, 
in order for us really to get the impact of this, the full impact of this, there's, there's probably a hundred things that we need to consider. But for me, there's really, for me, there's two key things we need to consider in order to get the full impact of this. One is the cultural context of what's happening here. And then the second one is to understand fully who it is here that's actually washing the feet, who is doing the washing. So what about the cultural context of it? I, I don't know if it's that. Is there anybody here that actually would say they like feet? Yeah, that's, I, that, Karis, even behind your mask, I'm getting what your face is doing, and I might would do the same. It's kind of like, right? Usually it's, now I'm, I'm, I'm no doubt there's people out there who like feet. I'm sure there are people who love it. I, I don't, and I mean, I'm not a hater of feet, but I, I don't particularly like sports people's feet either. You know what I mean? I've seen a lot of footballers feet and they're usually big long gangly toes and big bony toes. You know what I mean? It's like and this big overgrown first you know, big toe and all that. I don't particularly like that. I, I, to be honest, I had a bit of a bad experience uh, with uh, feet, not my own feet, uh, when I worked in the Causeway Hospital as in their IT department and I had to go around to a podiatrist clinic one time and I quickly discovered why they had a keyboard cover on the keyboard all the time. I'll tell you, I, well, anytime I had to go in there, and the, the, after that, I wore gloves in. It's, and there was no COVID around that time. There was a reason they have keyboard covers, and it's not nice. So I, I, I don't particularly like feet, right? And we don't particularly like feet. But aside from that, you have to understand what this actually means in the culture. So in this cultural context here, feet washing, obviously feet washing was something they would have done when the people would come into the house, they would have washed their own feet. But occasionally, and only occasionally, you would have had someone else, a slave there, to wash other people's feet. But here's the thing. Normally, it was never even a Jew. Even Jewish slaves weren't asked to do this because it was such a low thing to be asked to do. And so occasionally, you would have had some non-Jewish slaves, like non-Jewish slaves occasionally, who would have done this. It was such a lowly, menial task now, can you imagine what feet even would have looked like then? Like people walking about in, some would have wore sandals, probably a lot of people wouldn't have worn them, would have been barefoot, walking around on old, dusty, muddy roads, roads that didn't have cars in it, but roads that instead had a lot of livestock, and where you get a lot, get a lot of livestock, you get a lot of... So you can imagine the state of feet. The feet, and the feet of these people would have been the part of their body that would have been the dirtiest part of their body, daily. Because daily they would have had to wash their feet. Daily their feet, as we would say, were bogging. Right? And so to get down, and you imagine even the, 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 the thing of getting down, like the feet were even physically, they were the lowest part of somebody's body. You would have had to get down to the lowest, lowest position to wash their feet and so this is something that culturally would never have been done. And if somebody would have done it, they would have thought, oh, they're like the lowest non-Jew slave. That's awful. That would have been so looked down on. But again, in order to get the full impact of what's happening here, we need to also look at who is actually doing it. Look at verse 3. So this is just the verse just before what we read there. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. And that verse is so important. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, so he's saying he had all power and all all authority was given to him. He had all power and all authority in that moment to do whatever he wanted. He had it all. He had come from God. So he's emphasized his life didn't start, like didn't start with sort of with Mary. His life, he came from God. He is the eternal God who always has been and was going back to God, back to heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father, ever make an intercession for us. So he's, he's, He's pointing to his deity here. He's highlighting his deity here. He was fully aware in this moment of who he was. Sitting here at the table at this moment 
was divinity, was royalty. This wasn't just a, a teacher, a clever teacher of the law. This, in this moment, was the creator of the universe and sustainer of all things. Look with me over in First Chronicles. Turn over to First Chronicles with me just for a bit. And here we'll see um, how David, what David's description is of God. And this is just one description. We could have went so many places. But in First Chronicles chapter 29, First Chronicles 29, let's read from verse 10. It says, Therefore David blessed the Lord in the presence of all the assembly. So remember, as we read these verses, have almost like one eye in these verses and one eye on what, what the, the feet washing, right? What's happening here? And David said, Blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. And now we thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. He, then he rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. This is the same God who's washing feet here, and Jesus knew that. He's highlighting here that he knows. It's not as if Jesus has suffered a bit of temporary amnesia here uh, as to who he was. And now halfway through, he washes his feet. It's kind of like he gets a wake-up call, and it's kind of like, hang on a minute, what am I doing? I'm, I'm the king of kings. I'm God. I'm the creator of the universe. What am I doing washing feet? No, he almost sets this out at the start, saying, I know exactly who I am. I know where I've come from, and I know where I'm going. I know I am all power and authority has been given to me. And so here's the thing. I'm going to use all that power and authority to get down low and humbly wash the disciples' feet. I'm going to use it all for them. You know, this can only further amplify the ultimate humility of Jesus in this act. Such humility. He got so, he went down so low in every single way to demonstrate this level of love. And then think, like think even whose feet he's washing <clears throat> brings it even to another level. You know, he's washing, the, he washed the disciples' feet. So think of the two of those. Peter for one. Like this is Peter who, Jesus, and Jesus even states this in this chapter later on. He actually tells Peter, by the way, Peter, um, very shortly, you're going to deny even knowing me. Three times you're going to do that. Imagine Jesus fully aware of that. He's knowing that this Peter is, in a matter of hours or days, is literally going to <clears throat> deny even knowing Jesus. People are going to say, oh, you're associated with that. You're, you're a friend of that Jesus one. And Peter's going to like, me? <laughs> no, no, I'm not associated with that guy. No way. No, not wrong person, not me. See, Jesus fully knows that that's going to happen very shortly. And yet he still gets down and washes Peter's feet. Think of Judas. Takes it to another level. All right, he, he talks about this in this chapter as well, that Judas was going to be the one who betrays him. He knows that this is the Judas who very, very, very soon after this is going to sell him out to a mob who are going to nail him to a cross. And he, he, Jesus is fully aware of that because he's God. He knows what's going to happen. And so this is the same Judas who is going to very soon walk up to Jesus in um, the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus has literally just sweated drops of blood with the pain and agony of what was ahead of him. And this Judas, who claimed to love Jesus, was going to walk up to Jesus, kiss him on the cheek as if he was doing it out of love, 
And instead, all the time, he was just signaling to the mob, this is the one. This is the one we talked about. He's the one you need to take and murder. Now, go back to the foot washing. Jesus, knowing all of that, got down and washed his disciples' feet. And Jesus here is telling his disciples, this is the love, this is the kind of love I'm talking about, right? This is the kind of love I want, I need you, I'm commanding you to show to others. Look at verse 12 to 15. When he had finished their washing their feet and put on, put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you example that you also should do as I have done to you. Like, as I stand here, I know, I know personally, this is one of the hardest things that we will ever do. Right? The irony of it, even as Jane and I were, I think we were speaking a couple of weeks ago, the irony of this that when I was growing up, I used to think, okay, the love thing, whatever, that's the easy bit. Like, there's, there's harder things to being a Christian, right? Okay, I have to love people, well, okay, whatever. It's like soft, easy. The irony of that. Because now I have discovered that this is the single hardest thing to do as a believer is to love each other. But if we in Cornerstone, if we in Cornerstone want to be a church that reflects Christ to this community around and shows that we are a people who, um, who love and follow Jesus, then it has to start here, right? It doesn't start with our evangelism. It starts here. According to John 13, it starts here. It's how we love each other. And not just loving the people who show love to us, but loving the people who don't show love to us. It's not just showing love to the people who we like and get on with. It's showing love to the people who actually are nearly, in our eyes, impossible to get on with. There's, there's, no, there's no caveats in this verse. He said, love each other. For us, um, this, is, this is constantly under threat right? And maybe you, you, you know this and you experience this as well. That this is, see, for me, this is, a, this is a daily battle. This is a daily, daily battle. It's a strange kind of a concept, isn't it? That, you know, why, why is it so hard to love other people in our family? Our church family? And it's, it's such a daily battle. It's a war. And I think it's a war possibly because the devil knows it's so key and so important. Jesus has highlighted it as being one of the most important pieces of instruction to give as before he leaves. And so he knows it's important. And so obviously the devil will want to attack that because the consequences of it are large. But here's some of the, some of the things that'll... that'll and for each of us, there'll be, there'll be different things that'll try to threaten this, Right? For, for me, here's one of the things that threatens this level of love in my life. Um, entitlement. Right? Entitlement. Do you know, I can, I, can, I can very easily fall, naturally easily fall into like a bit of a victim mentality. A bit of a victim mentality, you know, where I'm, I'm, I'm tired of loving them and getting nothing back. Right? I'm just, I'm just I've, I've loved them as much as I can. Like, do, do, they, do they ever show any love to me? Because I haven't seen it yet, and uh, you know what? I'm I'm out. Or do you ever do you ever do that thing where you do this wee like a mini role play in your head? You know when someone's annoyed you or something's happened, and then you so you, you're walking about at work or you're doing something, and all the time you're doing this wee mini role play of what how a conversation is going to go with that person. And uh, usually that doesn't actually happen, but this wee role play it happens, and it'll normally go you know it'll, it'll say things like, um, "What? How, how can I love them?" Like, I can already love them if they're on my own. Or, you know, why, why do, when do they ever ask, when do they ever ask me? 
Well, when did they ever show love to me? Or when did they ever ask how I am doing? Or you know, when did they ever pick up the phone, call me, or text me, or whatever it is? There's always this thing that's like, you know, all this gripe. Usually those three many conversations don't go well in your head. Or maybe it's, maybe it's just frustration, right? How many of us have got just, um, just like to our what's end with frustration with people? You know, where it's just like, how many times, no matter how many times I, you know, I've tried to help this person and care for them, it just seems like I've hit my head a brick wall. I'm getting nowhere. I'm like, you know what? I'm out. Like, that's me done. I've loved the life clean out of them, and it's still no difference, so I can't do it anymore. I'm done. I'm out of here. Like, I, I, I walked in this morning. I was telling the first service. <laughs> I walked in here this morning, and... Um, it was sort of technical mayhem. So uh, <laughs> the sound team and all were just having one of those mornings. Like, that happens to us. We just have those mornings sometimes where things just, nothing's just going to go right. Like, even down to the very batteries in a remote in the other room. Like, it was just, nothing was going, seemed to go right. And in those moments, it, it just occurred to me, in those moments, that's where even love for each other are threatened, right? Because what are you tempted to do in those moments? You're tempted to be like, everybody's all panicking and, fr- and they're all frustrated. And you're like, oh. and internally you're thinking, oh my goodness, like I've showed them so many times. Like I might just show them what lead to put in and where to put the lead. Or like, oh my goodness, like why can't I not be here in time or earlier to get the setup? Or like, oh. and you have all this kind of oh, going on in your head. But obviously outwardly you're like, hey, how you doing? Lovely morning, isn't it? But inside you're going, oh my goodness, you're like, but those are the moments or some of the moments, even those moments are when this is threatened. Because what we'll be inclined to do is even come away from that and try to get into the blame thing. Where you're like, oh, you walk away from that person that's directly to it and you walk away to somebody else. You're like, oh, I'm a nightmare this morning, my goodness. Like, for goodness sake, like, can I not come early in the morning? Like, or can I not like, just listen? Or my goodness. And, like, oh. and all that, what all that's doing is just, it's just sowing wee seeds of division. It's not loving them. Certainly not loving them. And so when we, when we look at this here, like this, this, has to, this has to have an impact on, on those weak conversations we have with each other. Filter every single conversation you have with somebody through, the lab, through this lens. Are we doing it because we actually are loving the person? Or are we doing it because we're loving ourselves? And here's the thing. I... I, I will stand here, and as I said earlier, this is, a, this is a daily battle. For me, it's a daily battle. If we really want to love the way Jesus is teaching here, this is so, so, so hard, and it's a daily war, and it's a daily putting death to ourselves. It's a daily counting others more significant than ourselves. It's so, so hard. And yet, Jesus is saying it's so vital. It's so vital for us. So as we, as I close out in this chapter, can I say, for us as believers, don't give up on loving each other. I don't give up on loving each other. Fight for it with all that you have. Right? It's worth it. Let me read in 1 Corinthians, because 1 Corinthians gives us tangible definition of what this love looks like. Love for us as believers, it, it has to be at the very core of all that we do. I don't want to first John, when John's describing love, he, he says God is love. He doesn't say that God does love. Well, although we do know that God displays his love in so many ways that he does love, but he says God is love. It's like at the very core of being of who God is. And so if we want to be reflectors of God, we want to be image bearers of God, then it also has to be at the very core of us and our very being, this love for each other, love for our brothers and sisters. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 48. Look at these, love These are hard verses to act out. Love is patient 
and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never ends. Do you know, as I was, when I first read this chapter, the first time I read this chapter to prep it, there was one thing that really stood out to me. And it's what is said in that first verse, the second half of the first verse of John 13. It says, Jesus, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Right to the end. Child of God, Jesus didn't give up on loving his own. Neither should we. Neither should we. Is it going to be hard? Is it hard? Is it difficult? In fact, is it impossible without God's help and grace in our life? Yes, it is so hard. And yet there's so much at stake here. Jesus wants us to love like he loves. Let me pray and lead us into communion. And as we look at one final angle of this, just to lead us into communion. But let me pray as the guys come. Father, you are um, you are the very definition of love. Father, we feel so many times to love. Father, this, for many of us, in some ways, we'll wish that this passage wasn't there because it just seems too hard. It's too hard to do. And yet, God, it is here, and we thank you that it's here. God, we thank you that when you give us commands like this, it's for your glory, but also for our good. Will you help us to believe that it's for our good as well? And God, we pray that you will give us the grace that we need. We cannot exercise this type of love without you, Father, giving us the grace and the help and the power to do that. And so will you please help us? All for your glory, for our good and for the unity of your church. I pray this, Jesus, in and through your worthy name. Amen. So what Jesus did here in John 13, it was a real illustration, wasn't it, of what love looks like? But also what Jesus is doing here in John 13 is he's given a foreshadow of an even greater demonstration of love for the disciples and for us. So that's what Jesus is always trying to do, and here he's trying to do it as well. He's given them a, an insight into what was to follow. And so for Jesus here, as he, um, as he stooped down to wash the disciples' feet, it's a picture of an even greater cleansing that would be accomplished on the cross very soon after, that's where he would stoop to die the most shameful way a person could die. Crucifixion was reserved for the worst sinners. When somebody seen somebody crucified, they thought, well, that they knew it. That was, that was the worst of the worst. They were the lowest of the lowest sinner. And so Jesus was going to stoop to those levels very soon in order so that the disciples could be cleansed from their sin. Just as he served the disciples here, he got down and he served them, so he would serve them on the cross and taking the full wrath, the full weight of God's wrath for them. Just as he washed their feet um, willingly here, knowing full well that these people would feel in their love for him and feel in their love for each other, like pretty much straight after this. He knew that, and yet he still served them. Well, so as he served them here, he would serve them again on the cross where he would die for them, where he would die on the cross for a world of people who ultimately would constantly feel in their love for him and love for each other. He knew all of that, 
Like, this is the thing that amazes me about Jesus' sacrifice, is that He, he knew all of our feelings and all of our sin as we claim on one hand to be believers, but then we're just constantly failing and sinning and going against them. And he knew all of that, and yet He still willingly, just like He willingly got down to wash the disciples' feet, He willingly went to the cross. And so, when we find it hard to love, and we will find it hard to love, look, look to the cross. I know it sounds like a bit of a cliche, but for me, it, it helps because it brings me back to the gospel every time. Look to Jesus as both the example of love, but also the giver of love. This is what the good thing is. If you're sitting here this morning, and you're at a point where you're like, I kind of believe what you're saying, right, because it's there, but I, 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 I can't. I can't do that. Well, we're all in that boat with you, believe me. But Jesus just doesn't give the commands, does He? He also gives the power. He gives the grace. He gives the love that we need. It has to be from Him, right? Because love is actually a gift of the Spirit. It's a fruit of the Spirit. So, if it's a fruit of the Spirit, it means that it has to be given by the Spirit. So, it's not something that we can't conjure up this love. So, don't go out here like with this weight and you're thinking, oh, how am I going to do that? No, God needs to give us this love, right? He needs to. Some of us will feel that more than others, even maybe at the minute. It needs to be a supernatural God-given love, and He will give, and so ask Him to give. And so let's, now as we take communion, let's take some time to, um, to remember the sacrificial love of Christ for us on the cross, that selfless, self-sacrificing love of Christ on the cross for us, even as He knew all our feelings. But let's also take time to, to, to allow the Spirit to reveal things, to search our heart. Ask Him, God, are there ways that I have been failing to love? If you're sitting here this morning and you're kind of thinking, well, that's good, that whole idea of, you know, I hope they're listening to this because they've failed me this, they have then you've, you're missing the point. You're completely missing the point because what we need to do is we need to examine our own hearts and see where we're failing. And so ask God, through His Spirit, to, to reveal those things. Where, God, where am I failing to love people? Where am I finding... Where, where have I failed? Where am I finding it difficult to do that? And repent of that. But don't just stay there. Repent and then rejoice that His grace and His love covers all our inabilities to love, all our feelings to love. His grace covers it all. That's why He went to the cross, because He knew we couldn't, couldn't and wouldn't love perfectly. So He went and He did. He loved perfectly on that cross. And so don't sit just sit there feeling awful about maybe you, where you failed. Repent of it and rejoice. Repent and rejoice in His grace and His love for us in overcoming and covering all of our short feelings.